Father, we bow before you, great and mighty God, thanking you for the Bible. You have chosen to reveal yourself to us through a book. We are not simply opening a history book. We are opening your book, Yahweh's book. We know that you are revealing something about your character in today's narrative that we desperately need in order to be complete in thee. This isn't just fluff. This isn't just extra information. This is integral to our growth in Christ-likeness. So God, we are not taking this moment lightly. We came to learn. We came to worship. We came to submit. We came to repent. We came to plead for mercy. And we came to revel in forgiveness. We start a brand new book of the Bible today. We desire to receive from this book all that you intend. Take us deep with you. Sanctify us through this study of 2 Kings. Help us to come out with more confidence in you than we had when we entered. May we come out more joyful than when we entered. More courageous than when we entered. More repentant than when we entered. We fully realize these words we are reading were written and spoken by you well over 3,000 years ago. To another group of followers in a very different culture a very different civilization, a very different place. Yet these words are specifically written for us. We need these words. We need these words to invade our souls and bring clarity, to penetrate our hearts and bring comfort, to infiltrate our minds and bring wisdom. You've started a good work in us, we need you to continue that good work this day. There are voids in us that can only be filled with the truth of your blessed character. There are crooked thoughts in us that can only be straightened by your blessed correction. Father, we came to feast. Now please, spread an Old Testament table. This is our corporate plea. Amen. Thud. That's how 2 Kings begins. With a loud thud. A dull, heavy sound striking the ground. He fell two stories and is now confined to a bed. I'm picturing him in a body cast, unable to move his arms. The ancient king of Israel I'm talking about, Ahaziah. How did he fall two stories? Was he drunk? Possibly. Was he just a klutz? Maybe. Was he standing on the second story balcony of the Old Testament equivalent of the White House waving to all the minions down below then tumbled over? No. But we will find out later. You might be asking, Kyle, the second kings really have anything valuable to say to me. Old Testament stories are a declaration from God about God. These are not random events, random falls, random people. There is nothing arbitrary about these narratives. They are chosen by God to reveal God to you. We do not want to lose the Old Testament in the church. We do not want to preach like God left us with only a pocket New Testament. We alternate between New Testament and Old Testament books at our church because we do not want to neglect two-thirds of our Bible. That two-thirds of God's revelation of himself. Two kings has not always been two kings. It was just kings. First and second kings were originally just one book, but was divided for convenience in the 1517 printing of the Bible. It was originally a single scroll, an undivided book, one continuous narrative, a striking history of kings. It's, it's not like they couldn't fit it all in one book, so they had to write a sequel. 
No, it was separated for the ease of the reader. I preached 20 sermons from the book of 1 Kings. Now, 20 more from the book of 2 Kings. 40 sermons in total through the whole book of Kings. If you were not with us for the 1 Kings series, you can catch up online. What might God reveal about himself to us today? Let's see what he has chosen to pull the curtain back and let us behold about his character in this short narrative. Our story has four scenes. Scene one, who are you going to call? Scene, stop singing that. <laughs> scene two, <clears throat> dancing with the devil. Scene three, no chance of recovery. Scene four, playing with fire. Scene one, who are you going to call? Scene two, dancing with the devil. Scene three, no chance of recovery. Scene four, playing with fire. As we work through these scenes, I will drip timeless and timely truths throughout. We have truths here for parents, truths for those facing medical issues, truths for you non-Christians, truths, of course, revealing God's character, and truths that reveal our heart's idols. There is an abundance of timeless and timely truths. So let's get after it. The context, Israel is at war. Verse 1. After the death of Moab, after the death of Ahab, Moab rebelled against Israel. Let's stop here. And to make it worse, in the midst of war, <laughs> their king goes down. Kings were people's military champions. This injury disabled their champ. The story of this rebellion is not told until chapter 3, so I will not get ahead of the narrator. But let it be known, Ahaziah is stuck in bed, worried about Moab's troops mobilizing against Israel. Let's read in detail about this thud. Verse 2. Now Ahaziah fell through the lattice in his upper chamber in Samaria and lay sick. Let's pause here. People in Israel didn't sit on their front porch. They sat on their roof. Roofs were flat and steps were built up to what was usually a common area where the cool breezes could be enjoyed. Historians tell us the outer edges of more expensive homes would offer added protection in the form of lattice work like a balcony railing around the edge of the roof. Evidently, Ahaziah was leaning against the lattice work that adorned his palace when suddenly it gave way and the king came crashing to the earth. He essentially falls over a banister of his second story balcony. Now, this was some poor craftsmanship. The king paid someone to build that banister and it didn't hold. Someone has some explaining to do. I dug deep in the Hebrew and the ancient historical records and found the builder responsible. I traced his lineage and you can imagine my surprise when I found his ancestors built all the houses in Clarksville and Fort Campbell. <laughs> Apparently this guy just threw up the banister rather quickly, cashed the king's check and bounced never to be seen again. This is not a king wounded in battle. This is dodgy construction. We don't know if he was up there by himself when he fell. We don't know how long he was on the ground before someone discovered him. Perhaps his wife was folding clothes, looking out the window, enjoying the nice weather, watching a butterfly dance in the air, when suddenly she hears a scream, ah, followed by a body hitting the ground, thud. She drops the laundry and runs outside and discovers her husband's mangled body on the ground. The palace staff and the royal doctors come running to his aid. Will this fall prove fatal? That's the question the king asked when he regained consciousness. 
will I recover from the effects of this accident? He doesn't know whether he will live or die. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall and Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. So he inquired of Beelzebub, verse 2b. So he sent messengers telling them, Go inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this sickness. You would expect a king in Israel to call out to Yahweh when in time of need. But that's not what happens here. Ahaziah is a Baal lover. He seeks help from one of the localized versions of Baal, which may have been renowned for his healing qualities. He looked outside of Israel for answers. He wants his men to travel to the land of the Philistines. He sends them on a 45-mile journey to Ekron. You know, the apple didn't fall far from the tree. His father Ahab had gone after Baal, lock, stock, and barrel. Ahaziah is a chip off the old block. In fact, just look across the page to the last chapter of 1 Kings. The last paragraph walks this out for us, verse 51. Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel and Samaria in the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. And he reigned two years over Israel. He did that, what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and notice this, walked in the way of his father and in the way of his mother and in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. He served Baal and worshipped him and provoked the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger in every way that his father had done. Church, don't think Ahaziah calling out to Beelzebub was a sudden act of desperation, a moment of weakness. No, he displayed a routine disregard for Yahweh. In a moment of crisis, he called out to what his soul leaned on, Baal. His hope squats in a temple 45 miles away in Philistia. Given an opportunity to break with his idols, Ahaziah desired to cling to them. That's scene one. Who are you going to call? Now, Many theologians point out that our author is mocking the name of Baal. The writer tweaks one letter of his name to deliberately insult the deity. Beelzebul to Beelzebub. It's an intentional corruption. He's mocking Baal, expressing scorn. He intends to tarnish his reputation. He calls him Beelzebub, which means, with that slight change, the Lord of flies. This grammar is designed to denigrate the God and show how useless he is. It's a purposeful insult, a slap in the face. The story is communicating to Ahaziah and to us this timeless and timely truth. When you are staring your own mortality in the face, It's no time to go chasing after a mute and powerless God. When you are staring your own mortality in the face, it's no time to go chasing after a mute and powerless God. Friend, the gods to whom you turn have no ability to heal your sickened soul. They promise life, but deliver death. At the end of your life, who will you trust? Just because you're not in a body cast now, or diagnosed with stage 3 cancer now, or falling off a balcony now, doesn't mean death isn't knocking at your door. You will die. You will die. Whether you are a king or a peasant, 
May your own mortality sit with you as it is sitting with Ahaziah. Beloved, don't you live as if your brain cells are not dying and your arteries are not turning to chalk and your prostate is not growing cancerous. The fear that gripped the heart of Ahaziah should grip your heart. In 1756, George Whitfield preached to a packed Yorkshire parish. Whitfield announced his text to that massive audience. Hebrews 9:27. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. He paused was about to proceed, but was cut off by a wild, curdling shriek from the middle of the crowd. Those in attendance hurried to investigate, and some minutes later returned to tell Whitfield that an immortal soul has been called into eternity. This news was announced to the people. After a few moments, Whitfield again announced his text, It is appointed unto man once to die. Another piercing shriek rose from another part of the crowd. Horror settled over the assembly when they heard a second person had fallen dead. After the turmoil had subsided somewhat, Mr. Whitfield indicated his intention of proceeding with the service. He did so, doubtless announcing his text again to the assembly. It is appointed unto man once to die. May you listen as someone who has been awakened to the reality of their impending death. Ahaziah's own mortality has arrested his soul. Timeless and timely truth number two. When you overlook God in time of need, it is an affront to his godness. When you overlook God in time of need, it is an affront to his godness. Dear suffering one, what is it? What is it in your soul that when you get in trouble, you don't run to God? Why does despair send you to Ekron? God continued to pursue pursue Ahaziah by sending him trouble. That fall was God's messenger. God has afflicted some of you with health issues or with marriage issues or with work issues or with finance issues. Why is it not leading you to pursue God? It's not that Ahaziah is not broken. He's broken physically, he's broken emotionally, but he's still not broken spiritually. There are tears, but no tears of repentance. Maybe the reason you are not running to God is because you are not one of his. In a sense, this passage is calling you, Christian, to trust God through medical care we will all end up lying on our backs looking up to the ceiling. Trust the Savior who holds power over death. I like the way one man wrote nearly 200 years ago. He said, Sickness in old age is a divine trial to wean men from the world and ripen them for eternity. Whom will you seek? That's the question. Scene one, who are you going to call? Scene two, dancing with the devil. Ahaziah cannot even stand, but he chooses to dance with the devil. That's what awaits him in Ekron. God has a zero tolerance policy against contacting the spirit world for information. God alone has retained the sole privilege of knowing and revealing the future. But curious one, if you want to go to Ekron, the devil is happy to set an appointment with you. Did you know that in Matthew 12, Jesus was falsely accused and called Beelzebub? 
So that means by the time of Jesus, Beelzebub becomes a way to refer to Satan. Ahaziah is consulting the devil himself. Is Ahaziah asking for a prognosis or a healing? Well, probably the former, then the latter. You will run to who you think is in control. That's why you don't run to God. You don't think he's in control. What idols do you chase after when trouble hits home? What idols do you chase after when trouble hits home? We can all be tempted to look elsewhere. It could be blatant, like tarot cards, horoscopes, palm readers, witchcraft, astrology, crystal balls, superstitious sports acts. Or it could be less overt and and even subtle, like trusting Freud for counseling, prosperity teachers for theology, or alcohol, drugs, or food as a coping mechanism. What idol do you run after? Well, well, I will work more. I will exercise more. I will seek romantic encounters. I will shop. I will binge watch. Friend, work is not the answer. It will not bring you meaning or satisfaction. It will not be the distraction you are looking for. Weightlifting or becoming obsessed with your looks can become a full-blown substitute for God. Tony Marita said, and I quote, We live in a world that will turn almost anywhere for relief, but doesn't want to turn to a God that deserves and demands our all. End quote. Why do you possess this constant tendency to chase other gods? Whatever is worshipped ahead of, instead of, or alongside God needs to be removed. God will not stand for his bride giving her devotion to another man. That's idolatry. Who are you going to call? Scene one. In other words... Will you not inquire of the living God? Scene two, dancing with the devil. Our idols are much more sophisticated than those in Ekron. Scene three, no chance of recovery. Let's jump back in the narrative. The king's men are on the way to Ekron so Ahaziah can inquire of Satan. The story cuts from the king's men to God's prophet. From seeking Satan's voice to hearing God's voice. Verse 3. And the angel of the Lord said to Elisha the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say to them, Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are going to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Now therefore, thus says the Lord, You shall not come from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. So Elijah went. In other words, God tells Elijah, up on your feet. The king has sent his messengers running off to consult Beelzebub. It's an affront to my holiness. It's his latest snub among many. Three times here in this verse and in verse 6 and in verse 16, God repeats the question, is there no God in Israel? Ahaziah is living like there is no God in Israel. That he has to go outside of Israel. Elijah is commissioned and Yahweh's oracle will be delivered. Now, some of you non-Christians may contest. Kyle, sounds a bit harsh. The king is simply exercising his religious preference. You condemn a man to death for simply exercising his religious preference? Well, that leads us to this timeless and timely truth. God will share his supremacy with no one. 
God will share his supremacy with no one. He's an intolerant God. He demands exclusive worship. He thunders. That God doesn't have control of life or death. I do. This also speaks to the exclusive claims of Christianity. There were not many roads that led to Yahweh. Baal was not one of the many roads that led to God. No, Baal led to hell. The king is rebuked for consulting a foreign god, a non-existent, irrelevant, inadequate god. God will refuse, hear me, God will refuse to compete with any idol for the hearts, minds, and affections of his covenant people. Why should he have to compete for your affection? Verse 5. The messengers returned to the king and said to him, Why have you returned? And he said to them, Why have you returned? Now, what we have here is something called narrative telescoping. It keeps the narrative moving rapidly. The account of Elijah intercepting the king's men and relaying the oracle is missing. This is not a lapse from the storyteller. It simply quickens the pace of the story. That event happened, but we are not told about it. The narrative hits fast forward, going straight to the puzzled king. The king is shocked that they were back so soon. They must have been riding some fast camels. Verse 6 picks up the lackeys reporting back to the king. And they said to him, There came a man to meet us. And he said to us, Go back to the king who sent you and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall, shall surely die. This is an unwelcomed prognosis. You're not going to get out of the bed that you're in. His worst fears are confirmed. No chance of recovery. He discovered he was looking for wisdom in all the wrong places. These messengers came back having disobeyed the king's orders. They didn't make it to the land of the Philistines. They never got out of the borders of Israel. Notice what happened. Elijah pitted the king's words against God's word. The king told them they were to go to Ekron. God said, turn around and go back to the king right now. Thus says the king, never takes precedence over. Thus says the Lord. They abandoned their original assignment. The king doesn't seem to notice. All his attention goes to identifying who intercepted them and gave them this oracle. Verse 7. He said to them, What kind of man was he who came to meet you and told you these things? They answered him, He wore a garment of hair with a belt of leather about his waist. And Ahaziah said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. Maybe Elijah had become an obscure figure in Israel because these men didn't know his name. They simply described his clothing. And they say it was a a wild man, not readily conformed to society. He had a bushy beard like some of the men at FFC. He was a hairy fella. He had a distinctive leather belt a quintessential outsider. He was a mountain man. His garb, it looked like, it looked like one of those Duck Dynasty fellows. Full identification is key for the king. He starts to think he's getting the idea of who this is. This sounds like the prophetic uniform of Elijah. His hunch was correct. Now, he knew Elijah. They didn't know Elijah. But he knew Elijah well. His mother tried to kill Elijah. She put a bounty on his head. 
Jezebel is still alive, though not mentioned in this passage. Elijah prophesied that she will die and the dogs will lick her blood. That hasn't happened yet. Ahaziah didn't like Elijah talking about his mama like that. Ahaziah knew Elijah prophesied concerning his father's death, and that came to pass exactly as he said. In fact, this chapter opened with Ahab is dead. Ahab is dead. That's a good thing. You may think that is a nasty sentiment, but you must remember that Ahab was the conduit that allowed pagan sewage to engulf Israel. Elijah was at the top of Israel's most wanted list for the entire reign of Ahab. Elijah had already embarrassed the territorial god of Baal. Ahaziah knew the stories of Mount Carmel. The fact that Ahaziah even had to go outside the land to reach Baal was a testimony of Elijah's efforts to somewhat rid idolatry from the land and curb the Baal cult. When the king hears of the prophetic uniform and he says, that's Elijah the Tishbite. I think you are witnessing royal anxiety, a panic attack. It's a mix of despair and rage. And it causes him to verse 9, then the king sent to Elijah a captain of 50 men with his 50. He went up to Elijah, who was sitting on the top of the hill, and said to him, O oh man of God, the king says, come down. Now, we don't know for sure what hill Elijah was on, but he always seemed to be on some hill. He was a mountain man. He did his best work on mountains. They climb the hill and yell, the king says, get down right this minute. And church, the king doesn't have friendly intentions. He doesn't want Elijah to come over so he can invite him for dinner. This is flexing his royal military muscle. This is not a polite invitation, but threatening intimidation. He seeks to detain the prophet. He wants to eliminate the prophetic threat. At the very least, he's desperate to get a reversal of the prophecy against him. <laughs> Did he really think he could change the verdict of God? That he could capture and perhaps kill the prophet? His parents were killing prophets in mass, so maybe he wanted to follow in their footsteps. This army captain, followed by 50 men, intended to do Elijah harm. It's a show of force, a military contingent seeking to apprehend. They carry the authority of the one who sent them, the king. Remember, the king cannot go up to Elijah because he's bedridden. Elijah must come down to him. This 51-man posse strut onto the scene of the narrative sporting swords and shields and bulging biceps and a whole lot of arrogance. Church, what is happening here? Ahaziah tries to bring the word of God under human control. To silence the word of God by liquidating Elijah. Timeless and timely truth number five. What is your attitude toward the person who brings you the word of God? What is your attitude toward the person who brings you the word of God? Don't hate the messenger. Jesus even taught about this. He said, receive them as you would receive me. How you respond to them is how you should respond to me. Ahaziah rejects God's messenger because he rejects God. It's a hard heart that refuses to listen to God's word. He's given an opportunity to repent, but refuses. Like some of you, it's an opportunity. Scene one, who are you going to call? Scene two, dancing with the devil. Scene three, no chance of recovery. Scene four, playing with fire. Scene 4 begins in verse 10. But Elijah answered the captain of 50, 
If I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Out of the blue, lightning struck and incinerated them. It consumed them. They all fit neatly into an ashtray when God was finished. All that remained was a black spot on the earth. Elijah defended the sacred reputation of God. And let me say to you educated elite. Are you too sophisticated for miracles like this? This is not some Harry Potter figure who can call down fire. There's oddity to this text, but it happened. You often find in the Old Testament prophets against politicians. God sent prophets to confront kings. They fearlessly confronted the state authority. The book of Kings isn't just about kings. It's also about prophets. Prophets were covenant watchdogs. They were the prosecutors of God. God was filing lawsuit against his own people for breaking the covenant. The prophets served the subpoenas. Ahaziah will send a series of snatch squads. And here's the second, verse 11. Again, the king sent to him another captain of 50 men with his 50. And he answered and said to him, O man of God, this is the king's order. Come down quickly. Now the first 51 turning to burnt toast should have been enough to convince Ahaziah. But he's the pharaoh of Exodus. He doesn't learn anything. And he's even more determined. His heart is so hard that the previous judgment does not deter him. The second captain captain and, and his 50 men add the word quickly come down quickly do not keep the king waiting come down at once beloved God will kill people who seek to silence his word either now or later the word of God will have free course any effort to silence God's word will fail miserably. In many parts of the world, they love this particular narrative. They are in a culture where Christians face constant threats, intimidation, violence, imprisonment. As if the, the persecutors think that silencing the messenger removes the message. We, Christians in the West face intimidation in more subtle ways. Keep your faith to yourself. Religious views have no place in politics. Well, that may be truth for you, but don't you impose it on others. Verse 12. But Elijah answered them, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty. Then the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. It's an instant replay. Another divine lightning bolt. That's 51 more piles of ash. 102 people, 102 seared remains in total. Another one bites the dust. He dispatches of them all. Instantaneous cremation. And Elijah is thinking, keep sending them, king. I can do this all day. And he would have kept doing it until this entire Israeli army was burned up. Throughout this, Ahaziah remains unmovable. He sacrificed two captains and 100 men. He's bent on his evil no matter what the cost. He shows his stubbornness and intense hatred for God. You can be bedridden and bid God good ridden. You can be full of sores and still give yourself to sin. He's relentlessly driven to his own destruction. Now, a little side note. 
that I probably shouldn't give you. But I will. A little side note. Worship leaders should stop praying that God would send the fire. I don't think they know what that means. I don't think you want him to send the fire. Now, lest you develop a prophetic complex, you should realize Elijah was commissioned to a special ministry as a prophet in a theocracy. And it was his God-ordained task to confront an evil monarch who was attempting to usurp God's authority. You can't do this as a Christian. Call down fire. Now, Ahaziah was a seriously slow learner. After two unsuccessful attempts, he sends a third. Verse 13. Again, the king sent the captain of the third 50 with his 50. And the third captain of the 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and entreated him, O oh man of God, please let my life and the life of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. Behold, fire came down from heaven and consumed the two former captains of 50 men with their 50s. But now let my life be precious in your sight. The third captain had more sense than his king. His humility and survival instincts and proper fear of God will do him well. His posture, on his knees. His petition, please let me live. He will live. He will not face the fire. He will not be burned to ashes. He will not face the wrath. For the one who cried out for mercy, mercy will be granted. He was given mercy because God is full of it. There's mercy when you come humbly. This event teaches us something about God. The first two groups of 50, our God is a consuming fire. The third group of 50, our God is merciful. Who extended mercy to this captain? Was it Elijah? No. God said, don't send the fire. There is mercy, non-Christians, if you simply plead for it. Verse 15. And the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him. Do not be afraid of him. So Elijah arose and went down with him to the king. I like this. The angel said, Nail Ahaziah to the tracks, Elijah, and do it to his face. Elijah stands up and begins to walk down the hill. He's about to adopt the role of legal accuser and use judgment speech. He walks through the city gates of Samaria, 50 soldiers and one captain in tow. The streets are watching the shaggy prophet approach the palace. Elijah walks onto the property and there are construction workers everywhere fixing the damage from the two-story fall. Elijah is invited into the king's royal bedroom and there on the bed is Ahaziah in a body cast. He's a broken man on the outside. He's an obstinate man on the inside. Elijah begins to speak in a classic form of judgment oracle. Verse 16. Elijah said to him, Thus says the Lord, because you have sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, is it because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up. You shall surely die. <laughs> his delivery wasn't nuanced. He was intense, stern, being in the king's presence did not shake him. He did not temper his message at all. You'll never get out of this bed alive. It's the third time that statement has been made in this chapter. His death sentence pronounced three times. Verse 17. So he died according 
to the word of the Lord. Pause here, please. We go from prognosis to postmortem. He dies from an injury he sustained at home. God delivers on his threats. What did you expect? When Yahweh speaks, it happens. What Yahweh says, Yahweh does. What God promises, God delivers. Verse 17. So he died according to the word of the Lord that Elijah had spoken. Jehoram became king in his place in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, because Ahaziah had no son. Now the rest of the acts of Ahaziah that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? This is semi-conventional formula. It recounts not how he ruled, but how he died. He will pass the kingdom to his brother, since he does not have a son. This is Israel's first sibling succession. Ahaziah's wickedness shortened his reign. This man never repented, so he died and went to hell. He went from his bed in the palace to his bed in hell. That's the exposition. Now I want to leave you with five life-changing lessons. Five life-changing lessons. Life-changing lesson number one, don't play with fire. Don't play with fire. To reject the message of Jesus Christ is to play with fire. This story in our text will not be the last time that the fire of God falls upon non-believers. The Bible declares that there is coming a day when all those who reject Christ will be cast into an eternal lake of fire. As long as you refuse to call out to God, you are making your bed in hell. This hell in our passage points to the hell Jesus taught about. This hell on earth points to hell in eternity. If you are a Christian, this is your hell. If you are not a Christian, this is your heaven. For the Christian, this is as worse as it gets. For the non-Christian, this is as good as it gets. And I want you to have the correct understanding. Satan doesn't send fire. God does. Satan doesn't rule hell. God does. Satan's wrath doesn't burn you. God's wrath does. And your bleeding heart might wonder if Elijah was wrong to call the fire of God to kill these soldiers. And I respond, well, if it was wrong, it's not like God had to send it. There are other places where men called for fire to come down and consume people and God didn't send it. In fact, when Jesus entered a Samaritan village centuries later and that village rejected him, his disciples asked permission to call down fire from heaven and consume all of them. James and John were being personally insulted. They wanted fire. Jesus rebuked them and God the Father sent no fire. Lest you get the idea that the mean God of the Old Testament is impatient and the nice God, Jesus, of the New Testament is kind and patient, I will remind you that Jesus will burn his enemies in the end. Matthew 25 teaches us that. Jesus will rain down fire from heaven one day. Dear one, repent of your sin and don't play with fire. Do not say you will repent tomorrow. Tomorrow's repentance is today's unbelief. Ahaziah died an unrepentant man. Will you? The second life-changing lesson. Christian, Jesus faced the fire for you. Christian, Jesus faced the fire for you. The story of kings will, as Jesus put, bear witness of me. I have not done this text justice until I show you how it bears witness to Christ. I will not face wrath from heaven because Jesus faced that wrath for me. On Calvary, much worse than fire came down upon Christ. 
all the payment for your sin was poured on him. Second Kings begins just like First Kings began. A sick king confined to his bed. And it all points us to a sinless king confined to a cross. Jesus wasn't Beelzebub, but he defeated Beelzebub and any other form of Satan at the cross. God's wrath rained down on Christ, but he didn't turn to ashes. No, three days later, he turned to life. Life-changing lesson number three. The sick king points to the sick kingdom. The sick king points to the sick kingdom. God himself stands behind this text as its ultimate author. He is the true storyteller. What greater story is he telling? What meta-narrative is being taught in this smaller narrative? It is this, the sick king points to the sick kingdom. It's illustrative of the general decay of the nation. It's a sad commentary on the spiritual state of Israel. Israel, will you be like your king and refuse to listen? Will you face the wrath of God for seeking idols just like he did? Your checkered past looks like his checkered past. Kings is about the decline of the kingdom. Ahaziah's steady decline points to the nation's steady decline. His thud is to mimic their national thud. You might say the nation of Israel was having a heart attack and Elijah was the defibrillator. The original readers of 2 Kings were already in Babylonian captivity. And they were being pressured to adapt to their idolatrous culture. They were in quite a pressure cooker. Second Kings calls them to remain faithful when others around them are compromising. Church, from their pagan culture to ours, let's avoid the idols of our day and stay faithful until that day when he returns for us. The fourth life-changing lesson. This passage involves more than seeking God when you are sick. Don't forget, you can seek the true God in the wrong way. This passage involves more than seeking God when you are sick. Don't forget, you can seek the true God in the wrong way. I don't want your pharisaical heart to leave thinking that if you call out to God after you've fallen from a two-story building, then you've obeyed this passage. You can, and many do, seek God when, trouble, when troubles arrive. But then forget God when trouble leaves. You can, you can actually never go to Ekron and instead go to God and ask, God, how will this transaction play out? God, who will I marry? God, what does my future hold? And really, you are not seeking Him properly. You are seeking him the wrong way like he is a fortune-telling God. You want him to nurse you back to strength so you can go on living like he doesn't exist. You drift through the holidays without praying or reading the Bible. You act as if your grades are all that matters. And then you run to him only when trouble knocks on your door. God doesn't exist for you. You exist for him. So you need to pray something like this. God, use this trouble. Use this work issue, this marriage issue, this health issue to accomplish all that you desire in my spiritual walk. The final life-changing lesson. Parents. You are training your children how to react when they fall off two-story balconies. Parents, you are training your children how to react when they fall off two-story balconies. Hear me. Children will be influenced by their parents. You should absolutely get that from this story. 
Ahaziah was trained to go to Baal when crisis hit. His parents trained him to do that. They brought him up in Baalism. He is repeating the sins of his father and mother. He followed in their footsteps. He breathed in the poison of his parents. He had a lot of mama and daddy in him. Ahab and Jezebel. Jerome, an early church father in the third century, said that if you, if you pour a little puddle of water and then stick your finger in it and move your finger, the puddle will move with your finger. He said, and so children move with their parents. You teach your children inadvertently, implicitly, aggressively, passively. You always teach your children. You don't value church membership, they will not value it. You criticize the church, they will criticize the church. You bounce around from church to church your whole life, so will they. You skip corporate worship because you had a hard week, now they know what to do when they have a hard week. Your child is so good that he's on a travel soccer team? Then that dominates your life and takes you away from the covenant community? You are teaching them that their connection to the local church is not near as important as their athletic ability. Family time on the lake is vital for your rejuvenation. Instead, teach your children the best family time is in corporate worship. Let us train our children to walk with God while living in Babylon. 